Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Michael Pollan, uh, who is the Knight Professor of Journalism at UC Berkeley. His new book is In Defense of Food, An Eater's Manifesto. Michael, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. Good to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born on Long Island uh, in the town of Hempstead and grew up first five years in Farmingdale on the South Shore and then in uh, a town called Woodbury on the North Shore. And, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Oh, in many ways. And my parents and my grandparents. Uh, I, I got very serious about gardening as a young boy. Hmm. I, had a, uh, I had a grandfather who had been in the produce business and he was a passionate gardener and it, this is the late 60s and he was very kind of reactionary and there was not too much we connected on except plants. So, um, and I put in a garden at our house too, in imitation of his garden. And I, call, but I didn't call it a garden, I called it a farm stand. And uh, every time I could get six strawberries together in a Dixie cup, I'd sell them to my mother. She was, she was the only <laughs> customer. Um, so, you know, I had that, I mean, that was one thread. Uh, mm. Another was I had a mom who was, I have a mom who's a terrific cook and, mm. and very uh, aware of food. And um, so, you know, that was uh, a factor. You, you talk uh, in your writings a lot about the culture of, of uh, the, the, what cultures bring to food and so on. Was there a lot of that in your family? Your background is Jewish. And yeah, well, there was on my grandparents. I mean, they still cooked very traditional Jewish food, used, you know, duck fat, goose fat, or chicken fat to cook with. Uh, I remember on one side, uh, stuffed cabbage, big deal, you know, special, <laughs> you know, holiday food and balinces, uh and all, you know, a whole range of kind of Eastern European Jewish cooking. My mother did not cook that way. She fashioned herself uh, more of a cosmopolitan and she cooked, uh, you know, oh, every different ethnic, you know, we, we would, sometimes she would cook French, Chinese, Italian, you know, she was just kind of into... It was the 60s, it was that moment. It was, you know, the World's Fair. You know, you wanted to cook in, in every different kind of cuisine and she was very good at all of them. Um, and, you know, she doesn't cook that way, I don't cook that way now. Um, so one of the things that has struck me writing about food is how little stability we have in our food culture in this country, that we haven't held on to the immigrant traditions. Certain ethnic groups have more than others, but, but Jews, I don't think that to such a great extent. And, and I, I would presume, and we'll talk about this later, it's part of the homogenization that, that comes with, with American culture. Homogenization and demonization in, in the mm -hmm. case of uh, traditional Jewish food. Everybody assumes that's lethal mm -hmm. to cook with all that animal fat and uh, that that was, uh, you know, too much meat, too much fat. Uh, so I think that that's part of it. I mean, it's all mythical, but, but, you know, the Surgeon General didn't approve of the traditional Jewish diet for many, many years. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what about your schooling here when, when you were still before college? Did, did, were you fascinated by botany and, and so on or no. not really? No. 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 I was, so this uh, was an avocation in a way. Yeah, gardening, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I had no particular, and, you know, one of the great mistakes of my education is in college, I didn't take the courses that would be really useful, <laughs> such as botany. Yeah. I, 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 was at, I went to public high school and uh, I was always interested in writing and I worked on the literary magazine and, and English was my favorite subject. Uh, it took very little science. I, I regret how little science, but it was a kind of progressive moment in education where you could basically take what you wanted and make all the mistakes that uh, you know, people tend to do sometimes when they can take whatever they want. Uh, and, and in college, I, was, I went to Bennington College, mm -hmm. and there too, it was a pretty, uh, you know, free, you could design your own curriculum. And there was a wonderful botanist there named Ed Flaccus, and uh, I never took a course with him, and, mm. I, and I, I, it's one of my big regrets. But did you know you wanted to be a writer? You know, I liked writing. Um, I had the usual kind of adolescent fantasies about writing, but I didn't think it was uh, realistic. Mm -hmm. I didn't think you could make a living writing. I thought it was, you know, it, it was like imagining you wanted to be a baseball player. Every, every little leaguer has a, a fantasy of being baseball. That's how I felt about writing. It was not realistic. So I, I thought, well, all right, what, what's the next best thing if you care about writing? Well, one would be to be a professor of English. Another would be to be a magazine editor mm -hmm. uh, and work around writing or a book editor. So I kind of thought I would be on the peripheries of writing, um, mm -hmm. and 
you know, much to my surprise, ended up, I, I became a writer. Mm -hmm. And and you did graduate work at uh, abroad, at Oxford, did I uh, I did, I, no, it wasn't graduate work, it was undergraduate. Yeah. I actually, I transferred when I was at Bennington. Mm -hmm. I had, I studied with John Gardner, the novelist, and he kind of took me under his wing, and he was a very dedicated teacher, and he, he was like, he didn't. He wasn't crazy about Bennington, and he said, you, "You have to blow this popsicle stand and go somewhere serious." And I think you should go to Oxford. And he uh, he helped me get in, and uh, I did a year there, uh, and was sorely disappointed. Actually, uh, Bennington turned out to have been better better place to learn what I wanted to learn. Um, so I ended up coming back to Bennington after a year at Oxford. I mean, I got a lot out of it. Uh, you know, Bennington was a place where you could spend an entire semester on one poem in a class. And we did that. <laughs> and Oxford was a place where you would read a third of English literature in a year. Um, so it did absolute opposites, whether you go down deep or you go wide. And so it was kind of nice to have a little bit of both. Um, mm -hmm. But I was very happy to come back to Bennington, which really took its students seriously, really worked on our writing. Um, you know, in a way, kind of flattered the pretensions of students by treating them all as baby literary critics or baby novelists. Um, whether they really deserve that or not. But on the other hand, it built a lot of confidence in, uh, in its students. And, and I had teachers who worked very hard on, on, on not just grading papers, editing them. And that's, that was uh, very valuable to me. And, and uh, uh, let's talk about being a writer and being a science writer. What, what, what are the skills involved uh, here, do you think? Can, can you prepare uh, to become a writer, or is it just about writing? and learning the hard way. Well, you know, I would have told you a few years ago that you can't teach people how to write. Um, and now that I do it partly for a living, I, I'm, you know, I've, I've abandoned that position, mm -hmm. and not only for reasons of expedience, but because um, uh, I see that, that students do get better um, when they're edited by their teachers and, and when they're guided in their reading by their teachers. Um, preparation for science writing, per se, I don't know that there is any. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would argue that you could know too much about science to be a mm -hmm. successful science writer. In other words, I'm usually, I don't have a deep background in science, and I have learned what I need to learn article by article, book by book. So if I'm writing about genetic engineering of crops, I'm learning about genetics mm -hmm. for that article. I'm finding someone who can explain it to me. The virtue of that is, is I'm not much I'm not very. I'm, I'm not far ahead of my reader. Um, I don't take mm. anything for granted. The jargon is weird to me too. It's deeply unfamiliar. Mm. So I think I can write about it in a way that isn't so daunting. Mm. Um, I usually write as an amateur. I don't write as an expert, mm. and um, uh, so that I don't um, I don't scare readers off. I think when I when I do have to get technical. Mm. Um, and uh, so I think that there are virtues. I mean, in one sense, science journalism is no different than any other kind of journalism. You find people who know the story, you interview them, you watch as much as you can, and you tell the story. A lot of journalists are intimidated because science seems mm. so much more mystifying than politics, but it's no more mystifying than politics. Uh, two things stand out when I go through your, uh, your books, and one is uh, research, you know, in the sense that, that you're going to find a master's uh, dissertation at uh, Santa Cruz about somebody you're interested in. I, be, I believe the dentist. Yes, uh, uh, Weston or, Price. Yeah, yeah, Weston Price, who who actually was a forerunner to uh, some of the the insights. He had a lot of foresight yes. about uh, where American diet, yeah, 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 and where agriculture. So, so, and and also history. So, so being able to do research is important. Oh, absolutely, you, yeah. and history in particular. Yeah, um, I think it's you know if there's a if there's a failing of American journalism, and there are many, uh, one is uh, a disregard for history. Um, mm -hmm. That very often in the origins of a phenomenon, you discover yeah. the meaning of a phenomenon, and um, so. It's a perspective I, I, I always cover. Sometimes it's, it turns out not to be relevant, but one of the things I like about doing journalism, when I have a new article or book, is I make a list of the books I now get to read. Mm -hmm. I like reading books, mm -hmm. and, and there's always some history on that list. And um, uh, I'm always very interested in digging back to find the, uh, the history of, a, of whatever I'm writing about. Uh, and I think a lot of journalists begin by reading clips. They read other articles yeah. and they kind of stop there. And, uh, and I think you miss a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so even if it's a scientific subject, uh, it's really important to understand the history behind it. And, and it's interesting because if, if somebody like myself who 
I wasn't familiar with a lot of the stuff that you're writing about goes into it, and then you're suddenly reminded that there's a turning point in history in the early 70s right. when there was a secretary of agriculture named Butts, which is sort of in the back of your mind, but but is really a, a pivotal turning well, point. Well, that's a great example. Yeah. I mean, you know, we all hear about subsidies. We know that subsidies are kind of part of the problem and waste of money and all this kind of stuff. But, um, and we, we kind of think we've had subsidies since, uh, you know, Roosevelt. Since Henry Wallace was mm -hmm. his agriculture secretary. But were they the same kind of subsidies? Did they produce the same kind of agriculture? And then you kind of dig back and you realize, oh, we changed everything in the 1970s. We mm -hmm. changed our agricultural policies. And there was a, there is a real turning point in the history of American agriculture and food, and that is Earl Butts, appointed by President Nixon, with the explicit mandate of forcing down the price of food because we'd had this bout of food inflation, sort of like what we're having right now, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and that was triggered by the, the famous Russian, secret Russian grain deal, uh, which when it was, I mean, I could keep going back, but I don't want to go too far back. Yeah. But, but the, during the, the, the campaign in 1972, Nixon wanted to make sure to tie up the farm vote because he was running against a prairie populist, George McGovern. And so what did he do? He made, he sent Kissinger to broker a deal with the Russians who'd had a terrible harvest and needed grain badly, and he sold a lot of grain to them. It was kept secret for a while, so when the news got out, it led to uh, a panic, basically. In the grain market, grain prices went up. When grain prices go up, so do eggs, chicken, meat, everything. And uh, Americans took to the streets because food got so expensive in 1973. And um, there were protests. There was horse meat in the butcher shops. Uh, there were women boycotting, mm -hmm. you know, butter. Um, and uh, so Nixon needed to get the price of food down because there's nothing more treacherous to a politician than high food prices. Uh, we've known this since the French Revolution. And he hired Earl Butts. Earl Butts was a very skillful agricultural economics. Just died a couple months ago. And he kind of redesigned the whole uh, system of, of, of crop support in this country uh, in a way that stimulated farmers. We used to hold up prices, basically. We had farm supports. And he moved from that system to uh, subsidizing crops and encouraging farmers to overproduce, produce as much as possible. He was the guy who said, you know, get bigger, get out, plant fence row to fence row, move toward monocultures, uh, just crank out that corn and soy and redesign the structure, the structure of the subsidies to encourage that. And you can date the uh, obesity epidemic, so many problems of the American food system, to those policies, um, you know, as inadvertent consequences of what was a very popular thing, which is driving down food prices. Mm -hmm. And he did. I mean, Americans only spend 9.5% of our income on food today. That's less than anybody uh, in, the, in the history of civilization. And we have a robots to thank. Mm -hmm. So, so, it, and and you you've actually gone into a history that that is kind of a, a turning point. And and I think in your analysis, what's key is that that a number. It's like a structure of power, basically, a configuration in which science, journalism, and the and and the political leaders essentially. Uh, reach a consensus about something that that actually may be very harmful uh, uh, f for the citizens, and and so what what is uh, what is fascinating here is is that in the understanding food and agrobusiness, politics is very important. No question, and we're not aware of it, um, but it is you know, food like everything is political mm -hmm. and. There are, uh, you know, it is the biggest industry in the country. It's, it's the most essential thing. Mm -hmm. We've had the luxury of not having to think about it for the last 30 years, thanks to Earl Butts and having all this cheap food around. Um, but, you know, look, if, if we as a society have to live without gasoline, which is unimaginable, we will figure out how to do it. We did it for millions of years. Uh, we've never lived without food. And so food is really essential, and there is, when, when you have anything that's essential, there are enormous political and economic forces that contend about how it will be organized. And in the last, you know, 30 years, we have had this kind of agriculture-industrial complex, which by some measures has worked quite well. It's kept the price of food low. It's kept the food industry healthy. Um, it's given us a lot of power overseas. Um, we were big food exporters. 
Um, but what we're getting in touch with, I think, is that the byproducts of that system or the unintended um, consequences and costs of that system are catching up. Everything from obesity and diabetes, because that was a system that encouraged the consumption of food and specifically encouraged the com consumption of cheap corn sweeteners, high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils from soy, um, processed foods of all kinds, lots of cheap meat. Uh, so that's had it. so there's been a public health impact that's dramatic. And if you want to look at the problem with our healthcare system, uh, yeah, there's problems with inefficiency, bureaucracy, price gouging, bad information, but there's also a tremendous problem with chronic disease. Um, that is what's bankrupting the healthcare system, the fact that half of us suffer from chronic diseases linked to the diet. $250 billion a year in cost tied to that. Um, so that's one set of problems. The other set, is, of course, is uh, environmental. Mm -hmm. um, the, the food system contributes more greenhouse gases than anything else, uh, any other industry. Uh, and that happens at every level. It happens at the, at the field, the way we fertilize crops, the, the amount of energy that goes to produce that fertilizer, the way we uh, use machinery on the farms, the way we process the food, the amount of animals and the methane they release. Um, it's, you know, somewhere, it's about a third of greenhouse gases come from the food system and transporting the food all around mm -hmm. the, the world. Um, not to mention the, the agricultural pollution. Feedlots are the biggest source of pollution we have. And, um, you know, there is a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that's the size of Massachusetts today. Uh, that too comes from this way of growing food. So, you know, it's had benefits. I mean, it's quite an accomplishment mm -hmm. that, you can, that you can go to a restaurant, eat a fast food meal, you know, a big chunk of meat, um, french fries, large soda, uh, for less than the minimum wage, okay? Mm -hmm. In the history of humankind, that's, you know, that's quite an achievement. But it's come at a very high cost, and that cost, I think, is what we're getting in touch with right now. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it's interesting that when, when one reads your books, uh, which in a way are both simple, but essentially get at the complexity, and one is, one is amazed at the intricate process that has created the reality uh, that, that we, uh, we live with. And so let's talk a little about that intricate process and the way science has contributed to it. In, 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 in your books, you look at the history of science. You talk about uh, the uh, breaking up of the three uh, nutrients, the, the elements, the three elements that make up the nutrients in the soil. It goes back to 1840, yeah, basically. Yeah, well, Gustav uh, Liebig. Yes. Uh, Liebig, uh, who is, uh, interestingly enough, the, the, the guy who un came to understand both soil and human nutrition. Yeah. And in both cases, he found the holy trinity of, yeah. uh, of nutrients in, in the diet. Nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, phosphorus, potassium, yeah. uh, that's in the soil. Yeah. And in the diet, you've got uh, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like a lot of scientists, what you can measure becomes all that you can see. Mm -hmm. And this is what we could measure. And mm -hmm. it was understood for a long time that, okay, that's what soil is. As long as you give plants that, they'll be fine. Ditto, that's what human nutrition is. As long as you get those three macronutrients, you'll be fine. But of course, he missed a lot uh, mm -hmm. because he couldn't measure it. And so, just as a great example, this kind of reductionist thinking gave us baby formula. And he invented the first baby formula. There were a lot of orphans who didn't have a source mm -hmm. of, of food. And he said, I know what they need. And he created out of flour and water and a few other things, uh, fat, protein, carbohydrate, this is it. And the babies died. They mm -hmm. didn't do well on this formula at all. Why? Well, he didn't know about vitamins. Mm -hmm. So go, go fast forward another 80 years and you discover the vitamins. And then you put those in and you think, mm. now we've got everything. Now we've analyzed what mm -hmm. a human needs to live. That didn't work either. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the right kind of fats. There's not mm -hmm. just one fat. There's omega-3s, omega-6s, saturated fats. Um, so the whole history of both soil science and human nutrition, which are very parallel, uh, has been one overlooked nutrient after another. Mm -hmm. These systems are really complex. Mm -hmm. And we tend to oversimplify them. Uh, and I am sure that there are nutrients as yet to be discovered that will turn out to be critical for human health, ditto in the soil, that there, mm -hmm. are, there are soil elements, factors that we, don't know, we can't see yet. 
uh, mm -hmm. that we will discover are essential to plant or animal health. And, and I, I guess the key to what you're saying is that industrial uh, capitalism and agro-capitalism essentially takes a discovery and then finds the best way to make the most money as soon as, as possible, as soon as possible yeah. going down a road where a With lot of what we don't, yeah, 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 right. Well, uh, genetic modification, yeah. genetically modified crops is another great yeah, example. Yeah. Um, you know, we figured out something about genes and we understand that some connection between a gene, a protein, and a trait. And so we figured out a couple crops where we could, you know, introduce new genes from other crops. And um, we, to do that, it works, but we overlook a whole lot of complexity, mm -hmm. um, which we just dismiss as static. Uh, you know, why is it when we introduce this gene that 90% of the time you get a freak plant? Uh, well, we don't really know. It has something to do with gene expression. It has something to do with junk DNA. So we, um, you know, look, it's very important that science be reductive. Reductive science is, a, is very powerful. But it's always important to understand that you're missing some of the complexity. And when you apply that reductive science, you can mm -hmm. get into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, because you're mistaking what you know for all there is to know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lack of humility involved. And yeah, there is a tendency to apply these things uh, long before we know what's working and mm -hmm. what's not working. And, and a key turning point here is is the Haber-Bosch process, which you've written yeah. about. And, and, and talk a little about that, because it, it is a, a major turning point in, in seeing a synthetic fertilizer as well, arguably, a, the end all and be all of everything. Arguably, the Haber-Bosch process, which is, which is the, basically uh, the, the, the fixing of nitrogen, uh, mm -hmm. synthetic nitrogen. The, the limiting factor for plant growth is nitrogen. And uh, it is arguably the most important invention of the 20th century uh, in, in that it has affected more lives uh, than, than anything else. And that, that, you know, that's including the atomic bomb. Um, Fritz Haber was a brilliant chemist in Germany uh, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for this invention. It happens in 1909. Uh, Bosch was uh, someone who commercialized and figured out the technology to apply his, uh, his insight. And basically it allowed you to take hydrocarbons uh, uh, diesel fuel or, or natural gas and using a very high energy electric uh, catalytic process take um, nitrogen which is useless in the air it's all over it's 80 percent of the atmosphere but it's 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 not usable by plants or us in this form and fix it uh, and, and put it in a form that plants could use and therefore we could use and the great crisis of 1900 you know akin in a way to the I don't know, the biodiversity crisis today or the climate change crisis, what everybody saw on the horizon was there's not enough nitrogen to feed everybody. We're going to have mass starvation unless we can figure out how to get nitrogen out of the soil, uh, out of the air. Before then, all the nitrogen that was used in agriculture came from bacteria in the soil fixing it. You planted legumes, peas and beans mm -hmm. and things like that, and that would fix the nitrogen in the soil. Or lightning actually could give you a certain amount of nitrogen. Um, but that was proving to be inadequate. Uh, crops were failing. And so uh, Haber came along and, and came, figure, figured out how to do it. And it was a huge achievement. The only reason we don't celebrate him more mm -hmm. is uh, the fact that he went on to work on poison gas for the Nazis, and he was mm -hmm. on the front lines in World War I, and he just kind of uh, is a great Faust character, and his, his, uh, his knowledge was applied for evil ends. And uh, so we've kind of written him out of scientific history uh, to a large extent. But it was a great invention, and, and by some estimates, 40% of the people on Earth are here because mm -hmm. of that process. Mm -hmm. However, there's another great example of a, uh, a powerful technology that's had a lot of uh, negative effects. Um, Synthetic nitrogen, when it oxidizes in the soil, becomes nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, about 300 times more hmm. powerful in its heat trapping ability than, than carbon dioxide, even though it's shorter lived. Uh, nitrogen fertilizer is, became so cheap and is used so, uh, so profi profligately that it runs off and runs down the, um, the, the, the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico, where it has created this dead zone. Uh, the nitrogen 
uh, feeds the algae and they have a big bloom and they consume all the oxygen in the water and then nothing else can live there. It, it becomes a dead zone. Uh, so, and, and over time we have found that using too much synthetic nitrogen ruins the structure of the soil, mm -hmm. kills it, and uh, it becomes too salty and um, basically uh, nothing will grow. And you have the declining yield curves that we've seen all through the Green Revolution countries uh, because of too much nitrogen in the fertilizer. So, you know, a lot of these technologies are double-edged sword. They're, they're, they're wonderful and powerful, and they're horrible and disastrous. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and one should say here that, that l l lurking behind this, uh, this path of science that we've just described are political leaders often. And, and I know that you point out uh, uh, that it was after World War II, and we had this superabundance of munitions and right. so so it becomes then very important to find some place uh, to, to, dump it. to dump yeah. it and, well, and yeah please. well the, the yeah the um, the ammonium nitrate which is the product of the Haber-Bosch process is also the ingredient in uh, fer in uh, bombs um, as Timothy McVeigh reminded us all when he made the bombs in Oklahoma City using fertilizer fertilizer bombs uh, we had a huge uh, capacity to produce ammonium nitrate through World War II uh, there was a, a plant at Muscle Shoals in Alabama that was the great munitions plant, and it was basically fixing uh, nitrogen and making ammonium nitrate. After the war, we figured out how, do, how would we convert this wartime technology to peacetime use. And they thought about it in the Department of Agriculture, and they had some interesting kind of wacky ideas. One was, let's spray it from planes over American forests and, <laughs> and stimulate the growth of trees. Mm -hmm. And somebody else said, well, I've got a better idea. Let's put it on the land and use it to grow more food. Mm -hmm. And so we moved into a really, um, so on a given date, that, that plant at Muscle Shoals switched from making bombs to making fertilizers. At the same time, we took a lot of the research we were doing for, we were working on chemical weapons uh, and nerve gas, and we converted that technology to pesticide use. And a lot of the pesticides, especially that first generation of um, uh, of pesticides after World War II were basically mild concentrations of nerve gases. And uh, because, you know, insect nervous systems are simpler versions of our nervous systems and, and the same stuff works on them at lower doses. So that's why um, uh, Vandana Shiva, a, a great agricultural agitator in India, has said we're, we're still eating the leftovers of World War II mm -hmm. in that sense. We're, we're, we're eating the pesticides and we're eating the fertilizers that came out of the war effort. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, uh, we just had Neil Ferguson on the program and we talked a lot about the financial crisis and I, I hear similarities basically in, in these uh, two crises in the sense that uh, you, you, you wind up going forward with a process that uh, an element of it is globalization, uh, producing more, making more money, going down a particular path, and that it's not all, uh, there's some idealism here too, as you pointed out, in the sense that the, the notion here was to go down this path to feed a lot feed of people. people. Sure. Just as the housing crisis was opening up the opportunity right. for housing uh, to people who, who were only subprime candidates. Yeah, no, there's a lot of very yeah. good intentions. I mean, the, you know, there was a serious goal of feeding the world. Um, there was a lot of hunger. The Green Revolution is a great example. Uh, the Green Revolution is the application of these technologies to the developing world. Hybrid seed, uh, fertilizer, um, you know, ammonium nitrate fertilizer, and uh, irrigation techniques, um, and growing in monocultures. Mm -hmm. uh, we had famine in India, and we introduced these technologies, the Rockefeller Foundation and others, um, uh, UN was very involved, and you know, we did get the yields of uh, agricultural commodities way, way up. Uh, we fed a lot of people. Um, but it's also, you know, by other measures over the long term, been a disaster. Mm, I mean, right. you know, you have, you know, thousands of Indians committing suicide because they've entered this very high capital kind of farming. They can't afford the inputs that they're now dependent on. Their soils are not yielding as much because of the effects of the nitrogen fertilizer. And so they drink bottles of pesticide and kill themselves in great numbers. Mm -hmm. And and what, what happens, it seems, in both processes is a, a, a loss of checks and balances you know, that, that what is a, 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 initially an idea that has potential, but, but we don't continue to monitor the process. And as more information comes along, uh, uh, think about what the implications 
Uh, yeah. And here is where journalism kind of fails because what, what your writings make very clear is, is when we look at where we are with regard to uh, the products of agribusiness, it's, it's uh, we, we have no language to address the problems because part of what fails here is the communications that have uh, uh, been the way we define what's going on uh, until somebody like you comes al along and writes an expose. And you, you talk about nutritionism as a kind of an ideology that purports to be a science, which then is the way we deal with this new reality that at some point has become a Frankenstein. Well, yeah. When you're talking about nutrition, sure. I mean, we have we've adopted the 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 reductive language of, of nutrition from the scientists. Uh, we all talk about saturated fats, high fructose corn mm -hmm. syrup. I mean, it's a, it's fascinating to listen to Americans talk about food today. They sound like a bunch of amateur scientists. They don't talk about foods. They talk about nutrients. It's kind of bizarre when you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to your point about journalism. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, journalism could play a more aggressive role in assessing these things. But in the end, when you're introducing technologies, uh, you know, you need a public discussion and you need, a, you, you need to think through what are the benefits and what are the risks. And that must be decided publicly, not privately. I mean, I think mm -hmm. a lot of our problem is that we assume all, te all technologies are innocent until proven guilty. Um, and so we're very, in this country especially, we're, we're technological utopians. Um, mm -hmm. And we think you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a party pooper if you raise questions about genetically modified crops or something like that. There's a lot of money in it, a lot of interesting intellectual property for a lot of people, a lot of potential. And, you know, you're a Luddite if you raise any kind of questions. Um, and then, you know, 40, 50 years later, we deal with the, uh, the possible um, impacts. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that, you know, synthetic fertilizer was something we should, have, should not have done. But had we applied more of a kind of precautionary science to it, mm -hmm. we might have anticipated some of the problems and been able to mitigate them uh, before they got too serious. So I, I think it's a society problem. I think journalism plays a role in it, but you can ask too much of journalism. Journalism essentially reflects mm -hmm. the political culture of a country. One of the reasons we didn't have a debate about uh, genetically modified crops before we introduced them in this country, although they did in other countries, is because both the Republicans and the Democrats supported Monsanto and, and GMO technology. Mm -hmm. And when both political parties are on the same side, there's no space for journalists to operate. Um, they, they will not very, only in the, the, the fringes of the press will you find critique of, of uh, anything the two parties agree on. Mm -hmm. The New York Times won't go there, basically, and, mm -hmm. and the broadcast networks won't go there, and the Washington Post won't go there if both parties agree. Uh, so, you know, you can ask too much journalists to solve these problems, and, and we do, and that's fine. People should ask a lot of journalism, and I'm not, I don't mean to exonerate it, but you've got to look at the whole political system, especially the way we regulate uh, technologies, uh, new technologies, uh, toxins and things like that. Um, on the other point of nutritionism, it's been a fascinating phenomenon to watch. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I use this word nutritionism. It's not my term. It's an Australian sociologist came up with it, uh, and I read it somewhere. And, um, uh, but it's the idea, it's an ideology about food that's become general. And it, it, it holds, it's got four basic principles. The first is, foods don't matter, nutrients do. That a food is essentially the sum of its nutrient parts. And a food, you know, steak is kind of a, a, a vehicle for carrying protein and saturated fat because that's what matters. Uh, that's one premise. Next premise is that um, you can divide the world into good and bad nutrients. Uh, there's always an evil nutrient that we're trying to <laughs> rid from the food supply, trans fats, high fructose corn syrup now, or uh, saturated fat. And on the other side is a blessed nutrient. And if you could just get enough of that, you'll be fine, you'll live forever. And that, of course, was fiber for a long time. Now it's antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids. So that's the second principle. Uh, a third principle is if the important thing in food is a nutrient, and nutrients are invisible to normal people like you and I, you need, a, you need to be a scientist to actually see a nutrient. I mean, have you ever seen a nutrient? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> yeah. um, so therefore, you need experts to tell you how to eat. And indeed, we have mm -hmm. experts who tell us how to eat. And the fourth premise is, of nutritionism is that the whole point of eating is health. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You're either ruining your health or you're improving your health with every meal. 
And that's a kind of bizarre view of food. I mean, people eat for a great many other reasons. So I think we've, we've lost the whole, we've lost our sense of food. We've lost our sense of eating as a complex social as well as biological phenomenon involving community and identity and pleasure. All these categories have vanished under this regime of nutritionism. And uh, so I, I, in, in this last book, I mean, I, I, this is kind of manifesto against nutritionism and in favor of returning food to the center of our discussion about food and, um, you know, making health a byproduct of a happy relationship to food rather than the goal of eating. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that then takes you back to the culture of food that you might have found at your grandparents' table, yeah. I, I think, yeah. Well, I, you know, we have basically, you're right, we've essentially displaced culture as a guide mm -hmm. in, what, in, in telling us what to eat and put science in its place because it seems so much more scientific mm -hmm. um, so that uh, we think cultural wisdom about food is old, old wives' tales, um, you know, if, if your grandmother thought it was true, you know, she, I mean, what did she know? We have scientists now who can tell us all about antioxidants. Yet it's very interesting, you know, the, 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 the grandmothers were right about a lot of things. Uh, I was on a call-in show in Australia recently and a woman called and said, my grandmother used to always say, eat your colors. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very interesting rule. We now know that the important phytochemicals, plant chemicals, mm -hmm. all have a different color. And indeed, eating different colored foods is a guarantee that you are getting the diversity of antioxidants and phytochemicals you need to be healthy. How did that grandmother know that? Um, this was before we knew what an antioxidant was. Um, so my premise in this book is that culture still has a lot to teach us about food. And indeed, it is still wiser about food than science. That, you know, I know for a science journalist, this sounds like a very negative message about science. And I have enormous respect for nutrition science. And I hope that someday they'll figure it out, but they haven't yet. Mm -hmm. Nutrition science is approximately where surgery was in the year 1650. <laughs> it's, it's very promising, very Just interesting. Just figured out how to cook leeches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and they'll, they'll get it. They'll get it. But they don't, I think they'll get it. But they, as of now, they know a lot less than they think they do. And um, we would do well to tune down that whole debate about fats, about, about carbs that you, that you read in the media and not put so much stock in the latest nutritional finding because it will be contradicted by the next nutritional finding mm. and return to the, the cultural wisdom about how to eat, which guided people very well for a very long time. Uh, I, I'm curious because uh, I want to get back to your writing because uh, one of the things uh, that uh, struck me was your discussion about being a garden and being a gardener and creating your own garden uh, is a source for you, not only of the thing, the subjects that have interested you, but of, of the kind of values that drive your perception of the world. And, and you, you make a distinction between a gardener and a naturalist in one of your, talk a little about that, because I think it, it's, it's important because uh, it, you seem to be suggesting that to see things whole, you have to be whole yourself, and, and gardening is a way to get there. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, look, a lot of my work grows out of, of, of my experience in the garden. My first book, it's called Second Nature, A Gardener's Education, was really an attempt to use what I was uh, doing and experiencing in the garden as a place to explore our relationship to the natural world. Traditionally in America, if you wanted to explore your relationship to nature, you go to the wilderness, you do the Thoreau thing, the Emerson thing, the Melville thing. You have, your, you, you have your confrontation with wild nature, and that's essential and authentic. Um, and you know, that's a beautiful discussion, and Americans are really good at it, and it's given us things like the wilderness park, right? An American cultural invention. Uh, the idea of preserving a wild place that for most of history was regarded as wastelands and ugly landscapes. We learned how to appreciate them, and we've elevated them, and we've saved them. But that whole discussion and that worship of wilderness doesn't help you with many other questions. Doesn't help you with the 92% of the American landscape you can't lock up and throw away the key. Um, and that there are so many places where we need to engage with nature without destroying it. But we can't leave it alone. And the garden, in a way, is the great symbol of that place. It's a place where we mix ourselves up with nature, where we 
are in this reciprocal relationship with other species affecting us and we're affecting them and it's a beautiful place, ideally. And there is conflict though, mm. there are weeds, there are bugs. Um, you can't get away, away from that, but, but merely sitting back and worshiping it will give you a, a disastrous garden and no crop to eat. Mm. Um, so I began then with that very first book, which comes out I think in 92, um, getting interested in that messy place between the human world and, mm. and, uh, and the wild. And, um, and, and trying to figure out how to behave in that world in a way that I could get what I wanted while not destroying nature, diminishing nature. And uh, food is one of those messy places. And mm. all my books, as it turns out, have been about those messy places. Architecture is another one. I've written a book about architecture recently. Um, so uh, I think that the garden is a really important model and that if we would let the garden guide us in our dealings with the natural world, um, and, and by that I mean agriculture, I mean architecture, I mean design, uh, I think we would be better off. And right now we, we divide the world into the beautiful wild places and everything else that is just kind of fallen. You know, it's virgin or horror for us. And uh, the middle landscape hasn't gotten nearly enough attention, but that's where the action is. Mm -hmm. And, and do, you, do you think then that the failure of agribusiness has been to, to lose sight of the humanity and as it, it breaks down the elements of what it thinks Well, not is. to lose sight of the humanity so much, but, but basically try to push too hard on the culture side of that dialectic mm -hmm. and not appreciate that nature can't be bent to our will completely. Mm -hmm. That to conceive of a, of a farm or a garden as a factory, which is essentially what, agri, you know, mm -hmm. what agribusiness does, you put in these inputs, fertilizer, irrigation water, hybrid mm -hmm. seed, pesticide, and you get out those outputs. And nature is just the factory floor. That doesn't work because nature has its own interests. Nature pushes back. Nature is an obstacle to certain things we want to do. So that you need to think more like a gardener than a, than a factory manager. And, um, and when you do that, you find that there, there are ways to grow food of incredible quality, beauty, and healthfulness uh, while nature goes about getting what she needs. And, um, and that's really the challenge of, of good farming, is mm. um, figuring out a non-zero sum way. Most of our farming is, 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 bit, is like mining. It's, we extract from, from the earth. We extract nutrients from the soil. We diminish the land that, the longer we farm it. Um, well, that's actually, nature's not diminished and yet produces huge amounts of, of biomass in a forest, in a prairie. So is there a way we can get what we want from nature and leave nature not just undiminished, but actually improved? Mm -hmm. And the garden shows that, yes, that's possible. It's mm -hmm. complicated. You have to know a lot. You have to know about ecology and entomology and soil science. But we have models. I mean, I've been on farms that are doing that right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the challenge, is to bring that, the, the wisdom of the gardener to these larger arenas and, like and the And you say, I think at one point, that the uh, gardener is a citizen, a producer, and a consumer. And, and because, and, and that, that strikes me as being interesting because, in the end, you, you, a lot of the problems lie with politics. And so you're, you're suggesting that a food movement can bring a new kind of politics that might change this, this, yeah. this old system. Well, so much, as we were talking about Earl Butts earlier, so much of the agriculture and food system we have is the result of policy. You know, fast food, as Eric Schlosser brilliantly showed in his book, is not just the result of the free market doing its thing, it's the result of specific policies, mm -hmm. um, sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes not. Um, the kind of diet we have, this, this, this monoculture diet that's based heavily on corn and soy processed into all these different products, that's the result of a set of agricultural policies. So it stands to reason that another set of agricultural policies could give you a different kind of diet different kind of health outcomes as well. So that's really the challenge before this food movement, to, to uh, come up with policy ideas that will stimulate another kind of agriculture and also, um, you know, rebuild these local food economies which have so many virtues. Uh, you know, we used to think of them as nostalgic, um, but I think we're learning that to decentralize the food system is, uh, is is, is wise and cautious um, because having a highly centralized food system is also very precarious. Mm -hmm. Things go wrong. We mm -hmm. have now uh, 
outbreaks of food poisoning that sicken you know, thousands of people because we're all eating from the same bowl, in effect, mm -hmm. and we need to eat from a few different bowls. We need to decentralize the food system. So the food movement has many faces to it, and there are people who are working on school lunch and people working on community food security in, in the inner city, people working on you know, the farm and changing the farm and farm to hospital movements. Uh, it's a very big, inchoate movement that is just starting to gel. And, and be felt, I think, at the national level. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of where environmentalism was in the 60s, you know, around the time of Earth Day, where there was this incredible sense of the importance of this issue, uh, people in the streets, people very excited about it, yet it was not that well organized. 30 years later, there's, you know, I mean, there are problems, but um, there are cadres of policymakers and lawyers that are ready to now that we have a new administration, go into the EPA, go into the Interior Department, and, and they know what to do with those levers of power. We're not quite there with the food movement yet, but we'll be there, and it won't take 30 years. How, how do you answer the, the contention that, that the, the, the organic movement, the, the kind of food reform that we're talking about, is something for the affluent and not for the rest? Well, the, the, the criticism that it's elitist is a, uh, is a serious criticism. And I think that there are, you know, there, there are ways in which the food movement has been guilty of that. Um, however, um, you've got to look at, you know, it is true that, that healthy, um, fresh, seasonal, nutritious food is more expensive than conventional food and therefore has tended to be, uh, you know, enjoyed by the affluent more than others. Um, but you have to look at why that is. Uh, one reason is that we, of course, subsidize the other kind of food. Uh, the cheap food in the market tends to be industrial food. It doesn't have to be that way. It just happens to be that way because mm. of policy. The other point to, to keep in mind is that, it, like a great many social movements, this one has begun with the affluent. Um, you know, you look at women's suffrage and look at abolition. You look at the environmental movement. Mm. Many of these movements begin with uh, elites who have the time and the, uh, you know, uh, and the money to, to get involved with them. And over time, uh, they, they, you know, these, these movements, their politics spreads to a larger and larger group. And I think you'll see that with the food movement, too. Um, you know, if, if the food movement is still guilty of the charge of elitism in, in 20 or 30 years, that'll be devastating. But right now, I don't think it is yet. And there is a great, you know, there's a, there are large segment, segments of that movement that have focused on the inner city. I mean, the community food security movement, um, the school lunch movement, you know, the kind of work that Alice Waters is doing in the schools here in Berkeley. Um, if you've ever been in a Berkeley public school, you know that's a highly diversified um, uh, society. Uh, it's not affluent. And, um, uh, and reaching people at lunchtime, you're reaching everybody. That's not an elitist politics to be reforming school lunch. Um, so, you know, it's an issue. It's definitely an issue, and, and the movement needs to do a better job of addressing it. But it is, and it's very, and it's very aware of this movement, because like you, everybody asks us about that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's on our uh, minds. You, you wrote in the New York Times Magazine a, a memo to the first farmer, President-elect uh, Obama, well, he and, wasn't president-elect then. It was, oh, okay, it was but the before, although he, he cited the article, I believe I saw mm -hmm. in, a, in an interview in Time. And, and we, we've actually just talked a lot about the systemic set of problems that exist. And uh, in, in a way, the, the present financial crisis uh, is, uh, presents an opportunity. And a challenge. For, and, and a challenge yeah. for, for action. And, and I, I'm, you, you, you laid out a, an agenda uh, demonstrating the interconnection between the, the energy problems that he clearly wants to address, the health problems that he clearly wants to address, and the, the, uh, what you see as the food, uh, the, the agribusiness agri problems, which sort of isn't as widely perceived. Hopefully it is more widely perceived after your article. What, what is gonna be the handle and what sorts of things have to be done that are doable in, the, in this present uh, uh, situation where there are just so many crises? Well, there are, but they're linked. Yeah. And I think that that's important. And my point in this article was, I, I wrote it during the campaign, and uh, nobody was talking about food since Iowa. There was a little bit of chatter mm -hmm. about food when they were in Iowa. As, never too helpful because everyone in Iowa has to talk about they love subsidies and they love ethanol. Mm. 
Um, although they said some more interesting things actually this year. Um, but since then, there was not a lot of talk about food. And, but my point in this article was whoever's elected president, uh, if they are serious about climate change and addressing that problem, if they are serious about health care costs and addressing that problem, they will find themselves dealing with the food issue because food is the shadow issue over all those other issues mm -hmm. and energy independence as well. Our, our food system is heavily reliant on fossil fuel. The, the, the genius of industrial agriculture has been to replace human labor in the fields and in the processing of food with fossil fuel with the result that uh, a fifth of our fuel consumption goes to agriculture and, and the food system. Uh, as I said earlier, a third of the greenhouse gases come out of this system. So you're not going to deal with climate change unless you deal with agriculture. You could get the transportation system green, you could get the power grid green, but if you're still growing food the same way, you're going to have a tremendous problem with, with climate change. So you're going to need to, and you, you, could, you could start your national, you could nationalize health care, but the cost will bankrupt the system unless you get a handle on chronic disease, which is to say, unless you deal with the catastrophe that is the American diet. And that diet is linked to that agriculture. So that was my effort to, to, mm -hmm. to explain to the next president why this issue, with all the other issues on your plate, is worth dealing with. Mm -hmm. Because if you can fix the American food system, you will have so many benefits. You will cut down on health care costs. You will cut down on, on, on greenhouse gases. And I think by connecting the food issue to those other issues, it has raised its, its visibility in the debate. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I sense that, that it's, it's, it's being taken more seriously in the media, more seriously in the councils of government. And that, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, whether uh, uh, President-elect Obama is ready to um, go to war with agribusiness. I don't see much sign of that. And uh, it's probably premature to expect him to do that. But there's a lot he can do. Uh, and there's a lot we can do, too. I mean, we need to build this movement and make it bigger and uh, you know, create those cadres of policymakers and politicos to really drive change. Because make no mistake, the, the agribusiness industrial complex is very powerful. Harry Reid said recently that, that uh, the two best organized lobbies on the Hill are insurance and the commodity groups, by which he means the corn and soy people and the grain traders and that whole, that whole group. They're really well organized. They don't have large numbers of people, but they have got a lot of power. And, and they're under the radar. You don't, you don't, you you don't, don't hear about, you about them much. Yeah, yeah, you don't hear about them. No, much. but you will when they're, when they're pieces so, disturbed. So some of what you are proposing are, are symbolic. So, so I, I, I uh, read uh, in, in what you're saying here, you, you, go, you suggest going back to uh, victory gardens of Eleanor Roosevelt so the Obama children should have a garden for their little dog to run in on the White House lawn. So, so th that could not be unimportant in a way. No, uh, I mean, I, I offered in this article uh, changes at all different levels. I think you have to change the, the general incentives that are codified in mm -hmm. the subsidies to encourage farmers to use less fossil fuel and more solar energy. And you do that through diversification. I talked about decentralizing the farm, uh, the mm -hmm. food economy uh, as having a lot of virtues and also driving fossil fuel from it. But I also talked about the bully pulpit. These yeah. are things the president can do without any approval from mm -hmm. Congress. And that are things like put in a garden on the White House lawn. I mean, this would be an eloquent statement um, of you know, the fact that, you know, look, the sun still shines. There is abundance. Um, imagine a White House that was actually feeding the poor of Washington as well as feeding itself. Uh, it would send a very important signal. Um, so I, I don't think that those things are trivial. Um, I think that how the White House organizes its own household around food, the kind of food choices that are made in the White House, can, can set the tone, elevate the issue, because the more the public pays attention to this issue of food, the less tolerable the current policies will be. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly enough, there's a national security issue here because the centralization of agribusiness very mean, risky. means that, that there are very few places where all the food, whether it's the meat or whatever, mm -hmm. passes, which makes them vulnerable to a, a Both, terrorism that's attack. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, this question was examined. Tommy Thompson talked about this and the GAO did a study. And they said, yes, our food system is very vulnerable to terrorist threats because it's so highly concentrated. And we, you know, we wash 86 million portions of lettuce in the same plant in the Salinas Valley, eaten all over the country every year. 
we, we uh, grind 50 million hamburgers in the same plant. I don't know where it is exactly. Uh, so that one terrorist armed with a vial of, a, of, a, of botulism or some other toxin could sicken a great many people. Um, you know, we've prized efficiency in the food system. We can, we're very efficient. But efficiency is not everything. Resilience is very important too, as if not more important. And so you get resilience with redundancy, with having, you know, grinding your hamburger in a great many different places so that if something goes wrong in one part of the country, in one company, it doesn't affect all of us. So that's a very strong national security argument for decentralizing food. And this was understood by the government right after 9-11. They took a good hard look at this and decided, you know, we're not going to, we're going to leave this alone uh, because it discomfits too many powerful companies. One final question, uh, if students were watching this, how would you advise them uh, to prepare for a future in which food is food and, and, and the kind of food culture that we've been talking about uh, is, is taking place? What, what should they do to prepare for that future? Obviously, start a garden. Well, that's not a bad <laughs> yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. you know, you learn a lot in the garden. I mean, you, yeah. you, you grow a lot of food and you can economize with a well-run garden. But you also learn habits of mind that are going to be really important in the future, which is to say self-reliance, um, mm -hmm. basically, that we may not be able to count on the society uh, fulfilling all our needs when, when the oil runs out. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have to do a lot more for ourselves. And in the garden, you learn that, hey, I can do that. I can feed myself in a pinch. Very, very important lesson. Um, get out of the supermarket. Shop at the farmer's market. Um, you know, vote with your fork, essentially. I mean, every we get three votes a day when it comes to food. And those votes we have seen have an enormous impact on the world. How you choose to spend your food dollars is, is a very important vote that you have. And so think about how you cast it and, and realize that, yeah, you may spend a few extra pennies or dollars for that local food, but um, you're, you're accomplishing a lot. You're keeping agri uh, farmers in your community, farmland open in your, in your area. Um, you're building redundancy into the food system. Not to mention you're getting the healthiest, tastiest, freshest food you can get. Well, on that And cook. That's that one other very important thing. Learn how to cook. Because when you cook, you will be supporting local food and you'll be a lot healthier too. On that note, Michael, I want to thank you very much uh, for coming on our program. You, you were already in Berkeley. I thank you. I welcomed you to Berkeley. So you're said, so let me show your two books to our audience in defense of food. Uh, is uh, the most recent book, and, and before that, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals. Uh, I think that what people will find when they read your uh, writings is they want to read more and more. So, uh, well, thanks and, very much, Harry. And they, and they will see a world that they may not have seen before. Thank you. Thank Great you very pleasure. much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.